morning's lesson, Hypocrisy and Sincerity in Counterbalance. And we're still talking about Sermon on the Mount here. Now, something that a surface reading of the Bible will not reveal is the fact that the Jews of Jesus' day were very similar to modern Christians in their behavior. Today, in the so-called Christian world, there are those who believe that whatever you do, if you were once saved in your youth, you'll be fine. There are others who do all they can to prove to one another how good they are by following the letter of the law by their own will. Now, the first group are considered liberal, and the second are termed conservative. And yet, both groups fall well short of God's perfect will. Now, the Sadducees of Jesus' time were much like the liberal Christians of today. They acknowledged the importance of the law, yet they were very comfortable in their close relationships with the secular Roman government and the things that they required of them. They did whatever was necessary to see that their own will was accomplished and did whatever they could to advance their own personal agendas through their political connections. Now, the Pharisees, on the other hand, they were sticklers for following the letter of the law, much like uh, some who may be termed conservative Christians of modern times. But like many so-called Christians, their greatest concerns were based on their outward appearance and not God's internal influence in leading them according to His will. Uh, just as I'm reading this, I'm thinking about the, when Jesus spoke to the Pharisees. He said, you, you wash the outside of the cup and platter, but the inside are full of uh, disgusting things. That's, that is unacceptable to God. <clears throat> their greatest desire was to look good among one another and wield their self-righteousness as a weapon against those whom they saw as spiritually inferior to themselves. Now, both groups back then and now fall short of what God would have for His people. The Sadducees flaunted their freedom from the law by their actions, and Jesus didn't interact with them nearly as much as He did with the self-righteous Pharisees. They claimed perfection, the Pharisees, yet their lives did not bear fruit according to that profession. They all knew the law of God. Pharisees, Sadducees, and Christians of today all know the law of God. <clears throat> Excuse me. I lost my place there. And they all failed. They all knew the law of God and they all failed to understand both its importance and its proper application. Right. So regardless of whether they clung to the letter of the law or shirked their responsibility to the law, all were claiming an association with God, with the God of all creation, that was not accurately represented by their behavior. This is hypocrisy. And sadly, not all hypocrisy is intentional. There are those who just desire to, to look good. There are those who desire to, to be praised for the things that they say and the things that they do. But that's not the case with all hypocrisy. Both groups then and now often believe that their behavior is perfectly in line with the will of God. Uh, this is exactly what we see in Paul. He believed that the things he was doing, Saul of Tarsus, he was doing them for God's glory. He believed with everything that he was. He wasn't trying to be hypocritical. But his actions were going against the law, and they were hypocritical. Whether, whether we're serving God faithfully, uh, or we're, whether we're, our appearance is that we're serving God faithfully, or our appearance is that we're ignoring the law of God altogether, those appearances make it clear that we're deceived when our actions are viewed by their, in their motivations. Where do we stand? Are we in either one of these camps? Or have we allowed God through His ability, through His Spirit, to lift us up to a better place in Him? In the commentary this morning in the passage of Scripture under consideration here, Jesus counterbalances hypocrisy or pious pretense with sincerity or genuineness. It's a condemnation of the one 
and a commendation of the other. In all of Christ's recorded ministry, none are rebuked as, as, frankly, as frankly and as sternly as the hypocrites. This is probably because they were such rank deceivers. A hypocrite is one who pretends to be what he is not, especially pretending to be better, a better person than he is. Hypocrisy is defined as a false assumption of virtue, play acting, or the use of pious talk and, and actions which give a pretense or the appearance of goodness. As in chapter 5, Jesus warned against doctrinal corruptions. In chapter 6, He exposed the corrupt and hypocritical practices. In chapter 23, He boldly denounced as hypocritical the Pharisees, the most prominent and influential Jewish religious sect of His time on earth among the Jews. I do want to read a passage of Scripture here Matthew 23, 25 through 28. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye make clean the outside of the cup and the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Even so, ye outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Now Jesus personally addressed the self-righteous Pharisees here. Just as many Christians do today, these Jews were careful to follow the letter of the law. Yet their actions reveal their complete lack of understanding concerning God's will. These prided themselves in following the law. And by their actions, they oppressed those whom they saw as falling short of their own personally perceived value to God. God's will for His people is never to press others down in order to make themselves look good. His will is always for us to lift others up and closer to God. He knows that there will come a day when we may need one of these individuals to help us through a particularly difficult time in our own lives. But if we're always pressing others down, we may find ourselves without help in our own personal time of need. Jesus pronounced eight woes upon them. A woe in Scripture, back in the commentary here, means some great calamity, usually a judgment from God. As in today's denominationalism, there are some who are sincere believers in Christ. Likewise, there were some, though evidently few, good men of the Pharisees. Notable among them were Nicodemus and Paul. Excuse me. But as an institution, they were so corrupt at the core that Jesus warned His disciples, Beware ye! of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. And that's something that we all need to recognize. Hypocrisy, like leaven, spreads. When we see hypocrisy in others, we tend to assume the same kind of behaviors if we're not careful. We tend to take upon ourselves those same kind of attitudes and actions when dealing with those outside of the church, when dealing with those inside of the church even, sadly. We need to understand how dangerous this leaven is, this doctrine, if you want to call it that, of hypocrisy. In this lesson, we'll observe three areas of hypocr hypocritical practice along with three but thou's in counterbalance. Now it's my prayer that we'll all grasp the correlation between the past and the present so that we can all draw closer to God in the process. It's not God's will that any should perish. And He would use us to be a blessing, to be blessings to those around us instead of a curse. If we intend for God's light to grow in this darkening world, it will only happen by our personal individual drawing closer to Him and then by sharing that light that He gives us with others. Golden Truth, Job 27 and 8. For what is the hope of a hypocrite? Though he hath gained, when God taketh away his soul. 
Now we all have an innate desire. It's a, it's a human desire that we all have to look good. We want to appear good to those around us. Uh, uh, Paul, you, or the, the analogy is used of a mirror, looking into the mirror of God's Word. We look in the mirror in the morning, and, and if our hair is a mess, we do something about it. We've got something on our face, we take care of it. If we need to shave, usually we do it. I'm not, not always the, the best at taking care of that particular aspect of things, but uh, we do what we can to make ourselves appear good before we step out of the house. And that, that desire often translates over into the spiritual. We want to look good. We don't want to look bad. I got up and dressed this morning far better than I wanted to. Why? Because I'm in church and I'm supposed to look good. That doesn't mean that my soul is right with God. That simply means that I don't want, I don't want to come up here and teach Sunday school looking like a slob. It doesn't necessarily mean that I'm perfect. It means that I'm concerned about my outward appearance. I don't want anybody to think I'm, I'm lazy. You come in here, well, it's hard for me to get my hair messed up. I don't want, don't want to come in here with ha shirt, shirt half tucked, looking, looking sloppy, because I'm, I'm concerned about my appearance. But we can't allow that to grow to the point where we allow the enemy to convince us that because we look good on the outside, that everything is perfect on the inside. We want others to think well of us. We hunger for acceptance. It's one of the things that humans desire. We want to fit in. We want to be accepted somewhere. But if we have the acceptance of our peers, but don't please God, where's the benefit? Where is the benefit? If we love another, one another while we're in church, in the building, but shun those whom we see as less perfect, how is God being glorified? For that matter, if we love one another while we're in the church building, but we ignore one another when we're outside these four walls, where's the benefit? Perfection is not about how we dress. Perfection is not about outward appearances. It's not about the opinions of those around us. Perfection is about full surrender to the Spirit of God and His will for our lives. Lesson Commentary Part 1, Hypocrisy versus Sincerity in Almsgiving. Matthew 6, 1 through 4. Take heed that you, do not your, that you do not your alms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise you have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have the glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But when thou doest alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth, that thine alms may be in secret. And thy Father, which seeth in secret himself, shall reward thee openly. Webster's defines, psalms at al defines alms as money, food, clothing, etc., given to, the poor, given to poor people. Biblically, however, more broadly, it included deeds of mercy, not necessarily material things. Thus, doest alms rather than givest alms. This practice was according to the statute of law. Now, I, I can't read this passage that's in the lesson without going back up just a little bit here in Deuteronomy and reading a couple other verses. I just want to read Deuteronomy 15, verses 4 and 5 first. This is, as far as I understand, this is God speaking through Moses here. Save when there shall be no poor among you, for the Lord shall greatly bless thee in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance to possess it. Only if thou carefully hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe to do all these commandments which I command thee this day. And down to the verse here in the lesson. For the poor shall never cease out of the land. Therefore I command thee, saying, Thou shalt open thine hand wide unto thy brother, to thy poor and to thy needy in the land. Now those first two verses that I read that weren't in the lesson made it clear that if they were faithful 
to hear and obey God's words, there would be no poor. That's what he said. Save when there be no poor among you. Yet, just a few verses later, we read that there will always be poor folk among the people of God. <laughs> always. Now, this says a couple of things to me. First, God already knows how, already knew at that point, how God's people were going to respond to His direction. Second, He'd already made a provision for the failure that He knew that they were going to, to commit. How great God's love is for His people. That even though He knows beforehand that His people are going to fail, yet He loves us enough to supply for our needs anyway. With His concern for us, we would do well to share with others in the same way that God has shared with us. And since we cannot personally repay God, what can we do to pay God back? He expects us to be a blessing to others. Remember the account of the sheep and the goats from chapter 25 of Matthew. Jesus equated the service of the righteous to the less fortunate and afflicted as service to Himself. He said, when did, when did we visit you in jail? When, when were we sick and you saw to our needs? When were we hungry and you fed us? When, when, were, they, when, were, there, when were there hungry people and you fed us? When were, there, when were we uh, in, in need and you saw to our when, when, when needs? When did we do these things to you, Lord? They had no idea. But what happened was when they saw to the needs of the less fortunate, God was blessed in their faithfulness to Him. He saw that. He saw their faithfulness to those who are in need as faithfulness to Himself. And on the contrary, we see the exact opposite. Those who didn't see to the needs of those who, who were hungry and, and in prison and sick and naked. Who, those who didn't see to those needs. They saw that as a lack of concern for God Himself. How not to do alms, part A. Take heed as an alert, in this case against doing a good deed in a vainglorious manner, expressly to be seen of men or for public notice or acclaim. Now we've all seen this happen. <laughs> Those wealthy people give a million dollars to this or ten million dollars to that. That's, that. that's a lot of money to me. But it's pocket change to them. They're, they're giving from their wealth and they're giving in hopes of being seen. Because it's very rare that, that you hear, oh, did, did you hear? They didn't even, the news didn't know anything about this, but so-and-so gave to a cause. No, they always give openly. They basically, like the Bible says, they blow those trumpets to make sure that everybody knows all the news sources are covering that event. It's said that the Pharisees sounded the trumpet under the pretense of calling the needy ones together to receive their alms. But Jesus knew and declared that the real intent of this practice was that they may have glory of men, crowds of men. Take note that this was done both in church as well as in public. Now I'm sure we've all been in the service where a pastor or some other leader proclaims that we should all give to a worthy cause and asks for vocal volunteers to announce the amount of their financial support. All right, let's give to WMB. Who, who's going to give me $100 for WMB? Who's going to give me $100? I'll give you $100, Pastor. What's that any different than what Jesus is speaking against here? Or perhaps an individual may stand up and... Or a, perhaps an individual, that individual may have handled the matter more discreetly only to have a member stand up and say something like, I'll give $100 to this worthy cause. Who will match my donation? But once again, whether it's the minister behind the pulpit or someone standing in the congregation, the outcome is the same. In both of these instances, the individuals may have acted innocently enough. They may not have been intending to bring uh, recognition to themselves. But by their behavior... They were making this direction from Jesus very difficult for the others around them to perform. Romans 14, 16 says, Let not then your good be evil spoken of. 
Now this is perfect application for that verse of Scripture. We must use caution lest our zeal for giving to a church cause leads us into a vain and prideful type of behavior. Giving into this spirit robs us of any eternal reward, leaving only the vain applause of men. So again, if we're giving in such a way that we're being openly seen by those around us, we have no eternal reward. And Jesus makes that clear. He says that they have been rewarded. We already have our... If, if we're talking about how much we're given to a particular cause or how much we're doing for a particular thing, we've, we've got our reward. Oh, did you hear about so-and-so? They, they gave this much. Did you hear about so-and-so? They, they spent 25 hours doing such-and-such such for the church. And they want to make sure everybody knew about it. <laughs> we have to be careful. We have to be careful. Part B, how to do alms. Jesus' emphasis is on secret doing and giving. If done publicly, it should be done as quietly as possible. The right hand or the person, person closest by need not know what's given or how much. One's charitable or benevolent acts should be between him and God. Even the receiver may not know the giver, and the giver should not allow his mind to dwell on his good deeds. Self-conceit and vainglory can rob one of his eternal reward. Now there will be many opportunities for us to be used of God in this manner throughout our lives. If we have the proper motivation, there will be no problem in, in supporting whatever the Lord leads us to support. Also in the spirit of faithful giving as unto God. He will make opportunity for us to do so according to His will. We only have to be aware of the snares of the enemy in order to avoid them. But we have to be aware of them. If we're not aware of them, we can't avoid them. Proverbs 1 and 17 tells us, Surely in vain the net is spread in the sight of any bird. What on earth is he talking about? If you watch someone set a trap for you, are you going to then, oh, I wonder what this is, and step into it? No. You're like, oh my goodness, he's setting a trap for me. I need to go in the other direction. If we're aware of the enemy's devices, only then can we avoid them. But if we don't even know that they exist, we'll just walk right into them. God would have us to know all of the enemy's attacks against his people. That's why Jesus went out of his way to reveal them through his ministry. This is exactly what he's doing in these instances of woe. He's saying, look out. <laughs> Be aware. These things are things that the enemy is putting in your path to trip you up. This is a snare that's laid aside by the enemy. He wants to destroy you. I'm showing you that here it is. Here's a trap. Don't fall into it. Schofield gives a simple definition of prayer. Prayer is a child's petition to an all-wise, all-loving, all-powerful Father, God. It has been said that the real meaning of prayer is coming to God in an unpretentious spirit of total dependence, in need of His blessing, and asking for it with a vow to fulfill whatever conditions may be relevant to the receiving of the Father's promise. Now, if we ask in sincerity, God will provide in abundance. But we're also warned of our own deceitful motivation in James 4 and 3, where we read, Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lusts. Often when we pray for a particular result and don't receive it, we may have failed to recognize the source of our desire. God would have our needs to be filled, fulfilled. And He often supplies many of our wants as well. But our greatest desire should be to have His will permeate our being. Then Jesus says that God will supply for all our needs as well. Part 2, hypocrisy versus sincer sincerity in prayer. Matthew 6, 5 through... I'm going to read more than that. I'm going to read through 15, yeah, just like it says there. 
And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret. And thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask Him. After this manner therefore pray ye, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Excuse me. Part A, How Not to Pray. The Pharisees prayed as actors on the public stage. They prayed standing, the easier to be seen, and their eloquent lines more easily heard. The street corners were even more public than the synagogues. Jesus was saying to His followers, This is not the way to be heard by your heavenly Father. In Matthew 23, 14, He spoke to them in direct address. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayer. Therefore ye shall receive the greater damnation. How hard they worked for the, this reward of unrighteousness. Hell, it's according to Peter, 2 Peter 2 and 13. Prayer is not a covering for a life that is not fully submitted to God. Now don't get me wrong, prayer is certainly a place to submit yourself to God. But prayer publicly spoken in order to impress the human hearers will not impress God. It will not undo the hurt and shame that, that these individuals have caused by their hypocritical actions. In fact, I feel quite certain that those widows, house, those widows whose houses they devoured only saw the hypocrisy more clearly after hearing some of these public prayers. After they had been made the victims of their deceit, these prayers must have been almost painful for these widows to have heard. Their prayers certainly did not line up with their actions. If the human bystanders were not convinced or not fooled, how on earth could these prayers convince, how could, in, sorry, how could these individuals convince themselves that God would be fooled by their words? Vain repetition, decries, memorized prayers for daily repeating or for special occasions. The rosary form seems to be included here. Uh, just recently, Wendy and I were talking about some of the, the majority of the Catholic prayers. It's, they're, they're written out. You pray this prayer, here are the words you speak. That, I mean, Jesus is speaking directly against that particular thing here. And yet these believe that these prayers are, are what they're supposed to do. Now, Sadly, even the Lord's Prayer can become vain repetition if it's just mechanically repeated verbatim. The Lord's Prayer was never meant to be memorized and, and mimicked and just parroted. Rather, it's an outline of how our prayers should be offered. Part B. What does the cry mean? He uh, uses that word two or three times in here. I've never heard it before. It's, uh, let me see, where? Vain repetition is to cry and memorize. Uh, yeah, it's it's ta it's uh, uh, I'm trying to think of. It's, denounce. Yeah, denounce is a, yeah denounce is a good word. Speak against. Talk about how how it's not acceptable, basically. How to pray, part B. Again, in secret was Jesus' manner in place. The closet door is not even to be left ajar, with no one to hear but thy Father which is in secret. Hypocrisy is unthinkable. No one to impress with flowery words and egotism. The one hearer is omniscient, shut in with God, 
and the whole world shut out. All prying eyes and ears disappointed through all prying eyes and ears disappointed. Though Jesus does not forbid public prayer, neither does he advocate it. Those who do it or are called upon to do it should first plead the blood over their souls and endeavor to create a closet atmosphere. Perhaps it could be said that the heart is the true closet. Jesus offers the model prayer which has come to be called the Lord's Prayer. Well, I, think, I think the Lord's Prayer is in John chapter 17, and, and this would be the disciples' prayer, but that's just me. <laughs> Volumes have been written as attempted expositions of this prayer, which ironically is noted for its extreme brevity. Before offering this pattern prayer, he called attention to the fact that the Father already knows our needs before we ask Him. Therefore, much speaking is unimportant. Sincerity is of the essence. The spirit of forgiveness clears the way for being heard. Now that's, that's both our forgiveness of others as well as God's forgiveness of us. As the author states in this, in this lesson, prayer is a, this, the Lord's Prayer is a pattern rather than a list of words to memorize in a specific order. In these words we have an outline of all the necessary ingredients for prayer. According to this, prayer we should begin by acknowledging God and for who He is. Then we should pray that God's will be done as much as possible through ourselves. After this, we can make requests for any immediate needs we may have. Then we would all do well to recognize any personal shortcomings we may have and understand that our sins will only be forgiven in direct proportion to how we behave when others come against us. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who come against us. We must also seek God for guidance concerning our proper decision making and ask Him to open our eyes to recognize His direction when He gives it to us so that we don't go astray. And we should finish our prayers by accepting that all things, including ourselves, are His and are to be used for His glory. Part 2, Hypocrisy versus Sincerity and Fasting. Matthew 6, 16 through 18. Moreover, when ye fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces, that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou fastest, anoint thine head, and wash thy face, that thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy Father which is in secret. And thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly." A fasting is abstinence from food and drink for some particular period of time. Scriptural fasting is grossly misunderstood. Isaiah 58, 3-7 contains the Lord's words on this subject. And I, I want to read a lot of this. I don't want to read the whole chapter, but I do want to read Isaiah 58, 3-14. Wherefore have we fasted, say they, and thou seest not? Wherefore have we afflicted our soul? and thou takest no knowledge. Behold, this is God, God's response to them here. Behold, in the day of your fast ye you find pleasure, and exact all your labors. Behold, ye fast for strife and debate, and to smite with the fist of wickedness. Ye shall not fast as ye do this day, to make your voice heard on high. Is it such a fast that I have chosen? A day, a day for a man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow down his head as a bulrush and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Wilt thou call this a fast, an acceptable day to the Lord? Is not this the fast that I have chosen? To loose the bands of wickedness, to undo heavy burdens, and to let the oppressed go free, and that ye break every yoke. Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry, and that thou bring the, the poor that are cast out into thy house? When thou seest the naked that thou cover him, and that thou hidest not thyself from thine own flesh. Then shall thy light break forth as the morning, and thine health shall spring forth speedily, and thy righteousness shall go before thee. The glory of, thy Lord, of the Lord shall be thy rearward. Then shalt thou call, and the Lord shall answer. Thou shalt cry, and he shall say, Here I am. If thou take away from the midst of thee the yoke, the putting forth of the finger, the speak, and speaking vanity, and if thou draw out thy soul to the hungry, and satisfy the afflicted soul, 
Then shall thy light rise in obscurity, and thy darkness be as the noonday. And the Lord shall guide thee continually, and satisfy thy soul in drought, and make fat thy bones. And thou shalt be like a, like a watered garden, and like a spring of water whose waters fail not. They that shall be of these, they that shall be of thee, shall build the old waste places. Thou shalt raise up the foundation of many generations, and thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of the, the paths to dwell in. If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord, honorable, and shalt honor him, not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words, then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord, and I will cause thee to rise upon, ride upon the high places of the earth, and feed thee with the heritage of Jacob thy father, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. Now the people here were questioning God for not responding to their fasts in the first uh, two verses there, two and three. God's answer began with the last part of verse three. Their purposes were altogether selfish and evil. Verses six and seven set forth the God-chosen fast and the remainder of the chapter outlines the results. Part A, how not to fast. Once more, public display and vainglory are decried, spoken against, denounced. A long face or disfigured face, as with ashes, were done only to make sure that men would take notice. Jesus was brief. No doubt his hearers were all too familiar with the practice. Now there, there will be times when a fast can't be hidden. Now I, have, I personally have a hard time hiding a fast from Wendy, since we live in the same house and often we prepare each other's food. So it, it would be irresponsible and unkind of me not to let her know what's going on in these times. Otherwise, when we fast, no one should be aware of it. I've had to turn down dinner invitations, and, and it can be difficult sometimes to avoid that topic. Oh, you want to go out to eat with it? Uh, no, no, not right now. Well, are you not hungry? No, I'm fine. Don't worry about it. Uh, you need to come with us. No, I, I just I can't do it right now. <laughs> it's difficult sometimes when people are persistent. But most often, if you will simply look to God, He will direct your words with no need to lie, which would defeat the entire purpose of that fast you're going into in the first place. No, no I, I can't. No, I'm, I'm not hungry. You just destroyed it. You're done. You might as well go and eat. In each of these instances of woe pronounced against the hypocrites, it's the making public of private matters of God that destroy the effectiveness. God will only be glorified in us when we are not seeking our own glory. 1 Peter 5 and 6, Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God, that He may exalt you in due time. Matthew 23 and 12, And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased and brought low, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. Luke 14, 11, For whosoever exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. James 4, 6 and 10, But he giveth more grace, Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. Verse 10, humble yourselves therefore, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. Part B, how too fast. Instead of calling attention to the fast, all precaution was taken to conceal the fact. If the cause demanded withdrawal from normal daily routine, let it be done without fanfare. Now one problem many have with fasting is that they take the words abstinence from food and drink and think that's, that's all a fast is. If all you're doing is not eating or drinking, that's just a diet. That's not a fast. There's far more to a fast <clears throat> that, than we think than as Isaiah makes clear in the passage I just read. A fast is about the de denial of our fleshly desires. Not, not simply avoiding sin, not simply avoiding evil, which we're called to do every day, but a fast is for the neglect of the flesh to the feeding of the Spirit. 
If we refrain from eating and drinking and yet we watch our favorite TV shows or participate in our favorite hobbies, this isn't fasting. Fasting is a time for us to become refocused on God and His perfect will for us as individuals. Now as for the food we don't eat, do we just store it up so we can eat it later? Okay, well I'm not eating this meal today, I'm just going to have that meal tomorrow. Well this passage from Isaiah tells us that <clears throat> we are to use that food that we would have eaten to help the less fortunate. Fasting for the Israelites included refraining from labor, which would increase their worldly wealth. This is why they were condemned in this passage for exacting all their labors. Because the fact of the matter is, no, nope, I, can't, I can't work today. I'm fasting. God said you, you, can't, you can't work while you're fasting because that, that increases my wealth. So I'm not going to work today. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay out of work. I'm going to take a sick day because I'm fasting. Yet at the same time, they had their laborers, their, their workers, their servants in the field... seeing to their crops and their herds and making money for them in the marketplaces. So no, they weren't working, but they were exacting all their labors. They were making sure that they still had money coming in. So I'm going to fast, but you guys, you stay in the fields. You keep working because I want to make sure my money comes in. <clears throat> all of these activities were normal and acceptable. It, it was normal for them to have servants in the field working. These were acceptable things. It's, it's normal for us to want to eat. It's normal for us. It's not even a sin to watch some TV. I mean, there, there is some TV you shouldn't watch. But, but it's not a sin to simply watch uh, something on television. But if we're doing it while we're fasting, then we can't be focused on God. All of these accept, activities were normal and acceptable during any other time. But during a fast... All effort was to be focused on God without exception. Now, of course, it goes without saying that prayer should be a priority during our fasting time as well. Now, the next time we fast, let's, let's see if our fast lines up with this passage from Isaiah. As you're fasting, look through this passage. See, see what's expected of us. And, and let's be faithful. There's always room for all of us to grow in the Lord. Now, occasionally there may be a reason for a local church to agree together in prayer and fasting. Now, thinking about it, we're coming up on the assembly fast week, and God couldn't have put this one in here at a better time. <clears throat> and so we all know that we're going into this fast. If so, it should also be agreed that it not be made a matter for the news reporter. The Church of God is coming together for a fast. Let's call, let's call News Channel 9. If the results should glorify God, the testimony, let the testimony be totally impersonal. Now, when we are called to corporate fasting, we may all know that the church is fasting, but that doesn't mean we have to make it a public spectacle. Spectacle. In those instances, we may talk amongst ourselves. I know there have been times at headquarters when uh, someone from outside will send in a uh, an interesting picture of like pizza and food spread out and try to cause problems just being silly. And, and I, don't, I don't see anything wrong with that. We all know what's going on. In those instances, we may talk amongst ourselves about the fast, but it should not be discussed with outsiders. In conclusion, it's difficult for a sincere soul to understand the thinking of the hypocrite. As our golden truth asks, what's the hope? What is his hope? What is the hope of a hypocrite? Regardless of any earthly gains, does he never look beyond this life and ask, what are my retirement benefits? The egotists Jesus spoke about were the religious variety. How could they wear the rabbinical robes, read from the prophetic scrolls, pray scripturally worded prayers, give to the poor in the name of the Lord, afflict their souls in fastings, yet give no sincere thought to a reward beyond the superficial glory and of men's applause. Were they actually so completely deceived? If so, how did they get that way? Could a like deception engulf us also? Indeed. Have we undergone a conscientious self-examination recently? 
Jesus' teaching on these matters are down to earth and easily understood. Yet the devil is so subtle and men are so gullible. As I said, we all want to be uh, looked up to. We all want to be seen as good, faithful church members. That's what we want. But are we seeking to look good among ourselves more so than seeking to live according to God's will for His glory? We should never make drives for funds in such a way as to encourage being seen of men. Surely we can be trusted to support the church in all of its departments by simply making the needs known, then letting every individual respond. The gifts of the Spirit should be able to operate without us allowing ourselves to become conceited as being wonderfully used of God. Prayer must, be, must ever be encouraged, but how easy it would be for some great prayer warrior to become a Pharisee. Our fasting should not become a matter for advertisement. Remember the, Pharisees and, remember the Pharisee and the publican who went into the temple to pray. The Pharisee's prayer was totally egotistical and openly public. He prided himself in his supposed virtues. He reminded the Lord that he fasted twice every week and fully paid his tithes as though the Lord didn't know these things. The publican, on the other hand, he knew himself. And he smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. It's from Luke 18, 9 through 14. Jesus' com comment on the matter serves us as a never-to-be-forgotten conclusion to this lesson. I tell you, this man, the publican, went down to, the house, down to his house justified rather than the other, the Pharisee. For everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Luke 18, 14. What a counterbalance of eternal truth. Now, I, I can't read this passage from, uh, of the Pharisee and the publican without reminding us all that the moment we think, well, I'm glad I'm not like that Pharisee, you're him. The moment you think you're not like someone, you become them. Because in this instance, he was glad that he wasn't like the publican. We must recognize ourselves for who we are and not compare ourselves the moment we compare ourselves to somebody else. Well, I'm better than them. Then we're just like this Pharisee. We're a hypocrite. We need to recognize God's will for us and understand what it means to serve Him in faithfulness and sincerity and not in, in hypocrisy. The only person we need to compare ourselves to is Jesus. Right. And until we line up with His ministry, until our lives are line, lined up perfectly with His, then we have no right to talk about how good or bad anybody else is. Go ahead and turn it over. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, regarding the fasting, 